as the Miami Hurricanes are trying to rebuild the current O-line back to the glory days, let's talk to one of the greatest who ever suited up at the U. You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Alex Dono, University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet and contributor to allhurricanes.com. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. For the everydayers, shout out to you guys. Now, this is not the legendary former Kane, but he is a legend in his own mind and a legend on this show. The truth teller, Bruce Warner, is it is a truth teller Tuesday. Bruce, how are you, sir? Yeah, it's about time it's a truth teller Tuesday. It's been going on Thursday a lot lately. (laughs) So anyway, so two weeks ago, we had Daryl Spencer on. He was great. Last week, we had the great Jesse Armstead on. Today, we're going to talk about the offensive line. And so I decided to make a phone call. I called like 30 or 40 former offensive linemen, and I wound up with this guy. But I think he'll do. He's the greatest right tackle in the history of the school, my buddy Leon Searcy. Well, first of all, I'm trying to figure out how you called 30 linemen before me. That should have been the first lineman you called. He would have been my first, Bruce. Exactly. Well, guess, Bruce guess what? Sister. Guess what? I'm just BSing you. If you're with the I know you player. are. You got to be BSing. <laughs> <laughs> when you're the greatest lineman in Miami history, you're supposed to pick up the phone call to call me first. Okay. Well, I did. I did call you first. He knows no. it. I told him the other day. But yeah. you know I'm kidding around with you. And you're kidding of course around. I know you know, I got to bust your chops. Bruce. I know. I've been busting your chops shop, since then. I was so a senior. One day, one day, Leon came over to my house when I lived in Rock Creek with 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 uh, Mark Caesar. So they wanted like chicken wings. So I went to Publix and got a tray of drumettes. There were 150 of them on the tray. We sat down on my kitchen table. I had six. Those bellies ate the other 144. It looked like somebody dug up a graveyard with all the. First of all, first of all, I'm a delicate eater. I only had ten. Okay, so Caesar so you, did most of the. So day. you do the math. Who did the had the rest? <laughs> that sounds about right. All right. Anyway, oh. welcome to the show, my friend. So I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. A lot of on. questions for you, man. Oh, we, 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 we sure do, Leon. And, and Leon is a UM Sports Hall of Famer, former Pro Bowler in the National Football League, and obviously a former Canes great. And you know, Leon, bef- before we talk about your amazing career. You know, you are in any time we bring on someone like yourself who played in that specific era at Miami and you shared an offensive line with Mario Cristobal. You were Mm -hmm. a teammate of the man who's now the captain of the ship. So what can you tell me about Mario Cristobal? Was he a coach on the on the field back in those days? And do you think he's the right guy to bring Miami back? Well, Mario came in the uh, University of Miami in 1988. Uh, you know, his brother Lou was already there. Lou Cristobal was already there. So, you know, uh, the same intensity that Lou brought to every day in practice in the weight room and the games, you know, Mario had to oblige. He didn't have any choice. Lou has put the pressure on him to make sure that he came in and he worked hard, he said less, and produced more. That, that, that was Mario. Mario was probably – Mario was – listen, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Mario is one of the most talented linemen to come through the Miami, but he was one of the most toughest and tenacious and scrappy and fought each and every day. I mean, I, I, listen, he's an epitome of what he is right now as a head coach. You know, he's tough. He's, he's scrappy. He's going to put in the work. He's going to put in the grind. He understands that, uh, what, what's needed to be a, a University of Miami hurricane, and he wants to instill that in his players. So, you know, I've always had a great deal of respect for Mario uh, because he was my teammate uh, through uh, two national championships in 1989 and 1991. Uh, we always share a funny story together because uh, that Florida State game, uh, uh, he, I met, you know, I saw Mario because I have a radio show here in Jacksonville, you know, 1010XL, 92.5 FM lunch with Leon and um they had the ACC uh meeting in Amelia Island maybe last year and they had Mario on our radio show and I had to bring up the story where in 1991 we played Florida State and we were getting our asses kicked I'm gonna say asses I ain't gonna say but we were getting our, we get our asses kicked right and there's an offensive line we made a decision in the fourth quarter that we was going to make adjustments on the fly and not tell the coaching staff to end up helping us win the game. And he remember us being on the sideline and say, hell with that, we're protection. We're getting killed. 
We're going to switch it up. We're going to make our own effective calls, and then that's going to protect the quarterback and make adjustments with the running back. And th- in that last drive that we went down and scored that touchdown, we had made the decision on that sideline to to mess with the protection. We were going to get chewed out after the game, but as long as we won the game, that's all that matters. Now, and, and did you really get chewed out after the game? Because I and course, I understand, yeah. like, like for so, so Dennis we, Erickson, he yes, still had to because, chew you out because we squeezed the protection and made the the backs get the guys on the end because they had two linebackers inside, mm. so our linebackers couldn't get around the quarterback to block him, and he was getting sacked. So we were like, hell with that. We're going to squeeze the protection till tell the running backs to block the outside guys, and we'll deal with the effects of uh, messing up the protection once we get in the film study. And I coach. Greg Smith, he got on us, but he also appreciated the fact that we made the adjustment on the fly, which ultimately won us the game, and that helped us win that championship in 91. So you couldn't approach him on the sideline and say, Coach, could we squeeze it? We tried to. He told us to stay with the protection, (laughs) and that crap was not working. See, that story right there is worth having this guy on the show. Yes. Wow. Yes, we had to. We did it on the fly. We, we, when we kept telling them, Coach, we need to squeeze the protection because our running backs can't get around with the linebackers because we're not sure which one is coming. He said, no, stay true to the protection. We said, man, screw this. We're going to squeeze it, and we're going to make the man, linebackers go – I mean, running backs go to the outside, and then we'll adjust it. And that, that ultimately um, helped us win the game, win the championship. One of the, by the way, I looked on the, one of the top ten – uh, greatest college football games of all time. That's wow. in there. That's in there. Before we go on to more offensive line things, uh, Alex, ask him the question that we were told about him and the Rock. It's great. So we we heard this story two three weeks ago. We had Mark Caesar on, okay, and mm-hmm. he was talking about you guys' former teammate Dwayne Johnson, who's obviously you know maybe the most famous former Miami Hurricane player ever for, for different reasons. But, you know, mm-hmm. we, we were talking about what type of a, what type of a player he was, how he was in the locker room. And Mark Caesar told this story about Dewey, you guys called him, uh, where, you know, he, he, would, he would talk a lot early on. And then one day in practice, they put him up against Leon Searcy, and he didn't talk a whole lot after that. Do you, do you remember that matchup in practice? I, I do remember it. I do remember it. Well, I really don't remember uh, The Rock saying much, uh, you know, coming into his freshman year. He was, I mean, around me, he was, he was pretty quiet. But I remember the first time I saw Rock, he was doing freshman orientation. Me and the offensive line were sitting in the training table, and all the freshmen were coming through the training table, and we were giving an evaluation of the guys who came in there. It was like, uh, he ain't going to make it. Oh, he'll be all right. <laughs> He's pretty cool. And then we saw this grown-ass man walked into the training room. We're like, what the hell is this? He looked like a mechanic. He did. He looked like a mechanic. He looked like a 24-year-old, 34-year-old mechanic that came and they had this tight shirt on, jean shirt, and tight uh, shorts and sneakers on. We was like, damn. We, we said, more than likely, he's going to be a defensive tackle. So we have to deal with him every day in practice. No. But here's the issue when it came to Dwayne Johnson. Big physical kid. He had nothing but raw talent. And, you know, I take a great deal of pride in my offensive line. So he was going up against the younger guys in practice, okay? So he was ragdolling at all our freshmen offensive line. But we, none of them could block him. He would just toss them and all this kind of stuff like that. And the kid was getting a little bit, you know, a bit of, um, you know, he was feeling himself a little bit. So he got into a one-on-one drill with one of the freshmen or whatever. And I walked up to the drill and I told the freshman, move, I got him. So I, I said, I told the freshman to move. So he went up against me. And I had already picked him out on what he loved to do, whatever. So effectively, he came up against me. He tried to do that little double move against me, and I gave him some. Uh, I gave him some uh, forearm shivers to the chest and dropped him. Mm. <laughs> That's I punched him. That was I was known for that. I was known for my punch. And uh, you know, it, it kind of it was kind of like uh, that movie Silence of the Lambs. You know, he went a little quiet after that. <laughs> I had no, to put it on him. Mark said he after that he was pretty quiet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, it almost wasn't fair though. It was almost not fair, but you know because he was he was he was uh, making my offensive line look bad. I took it personally. Well, and and I want to talk about uh, offensive line play because you know we, we get to pick the brain of one of the best to ever do it at Miami. Leon Searcy is with us. The truth teller is with us, folks. We're only getting started here on this episode of Locked On Canes, and guys. 
you know I'm only getting started on FanDuel Sportsbook. I know the NBA Finals came to an end, but you can make your way to FanDuel right now because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. I love the great promotions every day on FanDuel. It's a safe and secure app. And you can get paid instantly. We still have the Stanley Cup Finals going on. There's a lot of soccer and obviously a lot of baseball going on this summer. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. For the everydayers, we are going to be talking with former Canes quarterback Malik Rozier tomorrow, but Leon Searcy is with us today. Leon, you know, I watched you play and everything and watched you dominate in college in the NFL, but I was reading up a little bit more about you uh, this morning. Is this true that you didn't start playing football until your senior year of high school? I mean, I, I, how did that work out for you? Obviously, you had enough talent to overcome the lack of experience pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I only played one year of high school. Um, had nothing to do with uh, my desire of wanting to play football because I was always a big kid, very athletic kid. I, I did a lot of, um, you know, unorganized sport basketball football as a kid ne- never stayed in the house you know i don't understand these kids nowadays that stay in the house because back in my day if you stayed in the house you was on punishment <laughs> and when i was young i was very athletic and playing everything i played kickball baseball soccer football basketball whatever so uh but in middle school i was a bit of a knucklehead i ain't gonna lie i was a little class clown i was a class clown because you know i didn't know how to assert myself with women i was you know i was a lover very young in my age whatever so i didn't know how to talk to women so i would be in class and i would make them laugh unfortunately teachers didn't enjoy this a lot and my mom who happened to be an educator was always made aware of the fact that her son was a class clown even though i still got pretty good grades so my know my mom knew i was skating through middle school she knew how much i love sports so she told me hey listen when you go to high school, she said, if you ain't got a 3.0, you can't play no football. You can't play any sports. I said, what? Because, you know, in middle school, I was 2.5, 2.7. So my mom had made it, you know, she, is in, in st- she is, uh, was assertive when she said, you can't play sports till you get a 3.0. So going into my junior year, uh, going into my junior year, I had a 3.75, you know, because my mom, whatever she told me I could get, I always did over just to say, <laughs> you know, I always got over whatever. So um, I remember walking to uh, elementary school to pick up my sister because uh, I would get off the bus, walk to her elementary school to pick her up and take her home. Uh, that one particular day, my mom was there to pick up my sister. And I overheard my mom talking to a teacher about how she was going to be able to send me to school. And it was going to be a crunch on them. So the last thing I wanted to do was to be a burden to my family, uh, who I love so much. So I, I was trying to figure out a way of how I could get to college without having my being imposing on my parents. Uh, the very next day, I went to school. I got the uh, I got the hall pass to go to the bathroom. And I'm walking in the hall towards the bathroom, and there's a recruit there from LSU. Recruit thinks that I'm somebody else. I tell him I'm not. He said, "You don't play football." I said, "No." He said, well, you know, you can get a scholarship to college if you play football. I said, okay. So that, that, that winter, I told my parents to, uh, they had no idea what I was doing. I told them to buy me a weight room set. And in my mind, I was telling myself, I got six months to train for spring ball, for spring ball, to, to get ready for spring ball. And I did. Every day I trained on my own. I ran, I lifted. I did every, all the weights and all that kind of stuff. This is all in my book, Fourth Down a Day, I'm a Lyman Store. If you want to get it, it's available on Amazon. It was number one on Amazon Hot New Releases two years ago. I love so I talk it. about all of this in my book. And so, you know, May rolls around. First day of football practice, um, you know, I was nervous. I put in all the work. I was still nervous. You know, fear was telling me to go home and not go out to practice. I had gotten on my bus. The bus had taken off. And about... 30 seconds into the bus trip on my way back home, I told the bus driver to stop the bus. I got off the bus and I went to football practice. And uh, I just think of how different my life would have been if I had stayed on that bus. But I got off that bus. I went, took my butt to football practice. I started as, um, I was a third string nose guard when I started practice. By the end of spring, I was starting. I was a starting right tackle. And uh, the rest is history. 
amazing. Yeah, it's a great book, Alex. It really is. I'm going to read that for sure. Yeah, I love, really I, I, especially, man, I, I, great story. I, I think sure. there was something else in here about his mother yelling at the coach. Right, Leon? Well, what, what, what I was way before, was yeah, way, well, way before, way before I made the decision to start training and get myself ready for football when I was 10 years old. I remember me and my, well, this was when I was living in Maryland. I was living in Maryland. And um, we'd all, me and my buddies had always played street ball, tackle football, whatever, but we never played organized football because we never really had the money to pay to afford it. But then we had saved up money. Our parents had given us money. And we're all walking to uh, Peppermill Village, which was uh, about two or three miles from where I lived. And me and my buddies walked two miles to organize football uh, to pay our dues to give us opportunity to play um uh, uh, football and when we went there uh we stuck out we stuck out because everybody there uh had equipment had shoes had gear we came in there with the same stuff that we played football in in the streets you know we looked a little rough kids laughed us or whatever but when we ran the drills we were athletic we were good we ran the drill i ran the good drills well or whatever and then i collapsed on the on the ground feeling um elated about what i had done what i had accomplished and one of the coaches grabbed me by my shirt, picked me up off the ground and said, what am I doing here? And I'm looking at him crazy or whatever. And he told me, how old are you? And I told him how old I was. And he asked me how much I weighed. And I told him, and he was like, uh, he basically told me to get my get my fat ass off the field, that I was in the wrong. All he had to do is just tell me that I was in the wrong grouping for my age because of my weight. But he didn't say that. He told me to get my fat ass off the field and go home. Totally embarrassed, totally hurt, walk back home, go to my house. I'll go up the stairs. My mom asked me, hey, baby, how was football practice? And I said, I'm not playing football no more. I hate football. I went up to my room. I was crying. Mama asked me what happened, and I told her. I told my mama, you know, what the coach had said to me. And I'm not sure if you ever watched the uh, animal channel, like Wild Kingdom, like when a puma, a puma when someone's a, 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 a female puma and, and someone's trying to attack his baby and what it does. <laughs> well, my mama, my mama leaped on that coach, coach like a puma on some prey. My mama, first of all, grabbed me and told me to get in the car. She said, get in the car. And she's driving. I mean, she's she's flying. And she's telling me the whole time, you better tell me who he is. And you better point him out to me. And my mom pulled me on the field. I pointed out the guy who it was. My mama ran up on the coach and said, did you tell my baby he couldn't play football? She said, yes, ma'am. She said, I want you to look at his face. I want you to remember his name. His name is Leon Searcy. One day he's going to get drafted in the NFL, and you're going to be the stupid-ass coach who didn't coach him. Wow. Well, first of all, your mom sounds like an amazing, strong woman. And she's uh, a gangster. She was a gangster <laughs> now. She was an educator. She was an educator now. She, she's, uh, she was, uh, she was a, a educator for 47 years in education. She was a principal, wow. counselor, and a teacher for 47 years. And she, but she was gangster when it came to the kids. Now, how many siblings did you have, Leon? Uh, just me and my sister, me and my oh, little wow. sister. Mm -hmm. uh, that's um. And so, okay, so when, when you did make it to the NFL and you were a first round draft pick, yeah, I, I can I always, imagine ce celebrating with mind, your mom. I yeah. always, yeah. When I got drafted in the first round, first of all, first and foremost, I wasn't thinking about that coach when I got drafted. I was too elated about the. <laughs> your fact. mom might have been though. <laughs> yeah, my mom was probably thinking about. I was too elated about the fact that I had just gone in the first round by the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> but you know, when when the waters settled a little bit, you know, I could I wanted to know if that guy was sitting in his living room with a pot belly <laughs> and a couple of beers, thinking like, "Wow, I remember that name. I remember Leon Cersei. I, 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 and a part of me wants to believe he was watching me when when I got drafted. Well, we got to get going to the uh, what's going on now because offensive line, Leon, as you know, as we've talked about over the mm -hmm. year, has been a big problem. Well, now you got some five stars and some new guys that are transfers, and I know you don't personally know about all these guys, but you can talk to us about what it's going to take for these guys to gel. Just because you have this talent doesn't mean come September they're going to be on the same page. Because if you you told me you told me before, if they don't have any experience playing with each other, it's not going to be easy. So talk well, about listen, I, I always you know even when I played or even when I coached at the few years that I coached the FIU, I always tell my teammates this that you've got to be married to the guy next to you. 
The offensive lineman is probably the, the guy next to you is probably the ugliest bride you'll ever see in your life. But <laughs> he's but talking about you, Floyd Jones. <laughs> but you have got to find a way to coexist together because you've got to take the five that five positions individually, and then you've got to create a fist. You've got to you've got to develop a relationship with one another to where it's spoken communication and unspoken communication. And the only way you get that is through practice, film study, w- working out together. There's got to be a cohesion between all five guys where they're doing everything together. OK, that's first. Secondly, there's got to be a mental toughness about you. All right. Because you are the only guys on the field where they never take you off the field, okay? D linemen get substituted, linebackers, DBs, everybody, all right? You're the only group of people where you, if you're tired, so what? If you got to go 80 plays, so what? Huh? You've got to. To you've got to have the mental toughness to go 60 minutes full throttle each and every play. Thirdly, you got to be a dog. You got to want to hunt each and every play on run plays, on pass plays, on twist, on double teams, on counters, all the things, all the, the naturations of everything about alignment. You got to be a dog. You got to be physically fit to go 60 minutes no questions asked no one's going to care if you're tired no one's going to care if you're hurting all they want to know is can you give me some more all right and lastly and lastly and this is the most important thing at all of all you represent when you put on that uniform at the university of miami as an offensive lineman you are a representation of all the greats that played before you. And you, it is bestowed upon you as a player to represent those who came before you to the fullest. That was my whole take when I was at Miami. When I came to Miami, and I only played one year of high school football, I didn't care nothing about no freaking NFL. I didn't. I did not care anything about the NFL. I cared about being the best Miami freaking hurricane I could possibly be. And if the NFL, and if you're that, if you have that kind of mentality, and I was afraid also of the guys who came before me that I wanted to make sure I represented them to the fullest. Yeah. Mel B, High Smith, Jerome Brown, Eddie Brown, uh, all the greats that came before me, Tester Verde, uh, um, all those guys that came before me. I want listen. It gives me more. Hey, listen, it, it does me. I get when I get admiration from guys that that I that came before me and tell me that I was a great player. That means more to me than anything. You know, when I when I hear guys like Dan Cilio or Daniel Stubbs and Jerome, this and that, sir, so you a hell of a player. Man, you don't know, that 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 means a lot to me. And these kids got to understand, you know, they got to understand that you rep, when you rep the you, you, you when you play at Miami, you don't just rep you, you rep in tradition. You're repping guys who laid the foundation for you to have uh, the, the nice dormitories, to have the NILs, to have the wonderful locker room facility that The Rock put together for you, to have the indoor facility. all Everybody, listen, if you know when I was at Miami, <clears throat> we had no facilities. We, we didn't have no, uh, we didn't have all that stuff that they have now. But I can tell you what, we had a lot of first round draft picks come out of that spot. We had a lot. So that that that's it. You, you just got to, every kid that, that Mario, and I'm sure, listen, I know Mario, I, I know, you know, the year they had last year was not um, something that uh, they probably bothered him. He probably didn't sleep well at nights because he knew that was not a clear representation of what he wanted Miami to be about. So <clears throat> now he's gone out, uh, recruited and transfer portal kids that are going to be um, because, listen, there's two type of kids that you can draft or three types, 
All right. There's there's kids that love the game of football. Okay. There's kids that love the game of what football can bring them. Mm. All right. And there's kids that love to play football to get to the NFL. The first, last two you don't want. The first you want. You want kids that love the game of football. And all that other stuff will, will take care of itself. Well, doesn't it seem to you, Leon, and I mentioned this last week to Jesse because he's in the NFL now, that a lot of these kids coming in with their stars and how many stars and NIL money, even before the <clears> NIL money, it's more about me, me, me. When you guys were there, yeah. you – Got rid of all the noise. It was all about us. It's us yeah. in the world, which I keep saying. Every mm. this well, it, it's, it's harder. Hard. It's hard. It's harder now for kids to uh, uh, not be uh, self-centered because social media has uh, tainted them um, immensely. Uh, a lot of kids, um, are, you know, they're pre putting on presentations to get likes. You know, they care more about. Uh, how many team? How many teams have uh, offered them instead of being great? You know, um, so I, it's hard for me to uh, criticize kids uh, for creating a platform for themselves to get exposure. But a lot of times, um, a lot of these kids need to focus more on being great at, at their position than affordably trying to be liked by the public. Well, Leon, I appreciate all your words and all your insight. And I also I appreciate the fact that you do a radio show up there in Jacksonville. And obviously mm -hmm. you, you love the Jaguars, but you're also you're a cane and you're surrounded by Gator fans up there. Does that does that ever get tough being surrounded? It, it, bro, <laughs> listen, let me tell you something. Right, the radio station that I work at, 1010XL 92.5 FM, right? Every per all my colleagues who I love dearly are along with the Florida. Mm. every last one of them and i gotta fight like a dog in the streets to get any kind of miami attention up here but i do i, I swing do. with the best of them i damn sure swing with the best of them <laughs> to represent my canes to the fullest and i specifically remember that interview that you did with cristobal last year because it was it was very well represented on the internet and i remember <laughs> thinking yeah leon great job up there and and leon if you want it before we let you run Plug the radio show again, because these days people all around the country can listen to your radio show and hear from a great former Kane. So where can they find that? Okay, you can you can uh, download the app uh, at your app store at 1010XL. Uh, it's 1010XL 92.5 FM, Jacksonville. You can watch us on YouTube as well. You can go to YouTube and watch us as well. And you can purchase my book, Fourth Down and Dam. If you love these amazing stories that I told, it's in my uh, book, Fourth Down the Dam, a Lima story, available on Amazon and Audible. And I'm working on the script. So look oh, close. Yeah, you told me. And, 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 and Bruce is helping me with some that, stuff, too. Oh, man. Well, if, uh, if, there, if there's anything I can do as well to help you get out the word for that, I, I, would, I would love to, Leon, because that, that's a story that needs to be told to the masses on every medium, right? From the book. Absolutely. We're, we're going to bring it. Uh, read that book. All you guys listening yeah. to this that are watching this, read that book. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a really detail. And, and Leon leaves no stone unturned, and nor does he hide the truth. He tells mm -hmm. the truth, good or bad. And there's a lot of bad in there, and Leon and I know. But you know what? It's a it, it comes from his heart, and that's what makes him so great. Things come from his heart. If he says he's going to do this show, he's doing the show. And I and so I really appreciate Leon being on the show, and his friendship, and all the stories. There's a lot more stories. If we had him on for another four hours, we'll have to get him on again sometime. Leon, thank you so much for taking the time. No problem. I appreciate you having me. And huge thank you, Bruce Warner, as well, my friend. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right, Leon, take care, my friend. I'll be in you touch. You got it, bro. Alex, let's get some good reviews of the show, and I'll talk to you soon. Let's do it. We'll talk to everyone again next time on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.